friends, welcome back to my channel. If you are new, my name is Mary and I'm so happy to have you here for today's video where I am gonna be talking about my endometriosis and adenomyosis diagnosis, that's a lot of isses, um, after many years of infertility and undiagnosed infertility, I finally recently got my diagnosis and um, in the process of getting my diagnosis, I've learned a lot about adenomyosis and endometriosis, about some of the things that can cause it or make it worse, um, ways to treat it. I also want to talk about, you know, kind of some of my symptoms that I didn't realize were symptoms, but actually were symptoms, and my doctor's treatment plan to help me get pregnant now that we know I have adenomyosis and endometriosis. So a really quick and dirty and simple way to explain what both adenomyosis and endometriosis are is it's when your uterine lining, your endometrial tissue, endometrial cells grow in places they're not supposed to, right? So typically once a month, you start creating a uterine lining for a little baby to nuzzle into and hang out in. Um, and it's made up of these endometrial cells. And when you have endometriosis, um, these cells can travel outside of the fallopian tubes just into your pelvis, pelvis, pelvic, into plate outside of your reproductive system and start attaching like there have been women who had endometriosis that had grown and kind of wrapped around like their their bowels and their you know outside of the ovaries and the just everywhere and then adenomyosis is where these endometrial cells are growing inside of your uterine muscle. And I may have mixed up the words a little bit, but that's what it is is these is the things that normally form your uterine lining inside of your uterus are like hey peace out, we're going elsewhere. And endometriosis is the much more common one or much more commonly known. But based on my research, and then I confirmed this, you know, kind of assumption with my doctor, um, typically, women who have adenomyosis have some level of endometriosis. And some women who have endometriosis also have some amount of adenomyosis. The cells aren't that selective with where they end up. They just kind of go where they're not supposed to. But endometriosis is typically more commonly spotted, basically. It's a little bit easier to see and diagnose. But I was reading that these two things tend to go hand in hand, and my doctor confirmed that when I asked him about it. So how I got diagnosed, um, so I'm someone who, uh, in the past, I've had miscarriages. I've had two miscarriages. Um, both took place later on in the first trimester. Like you typically hear about how the majority of miscarriages happen in the first trimester, like one in four pregnancies end in the first trimester. But the majority of those miscarriages happen before a heartbeat is established. Once the baby has a heartbeat, the, the likelihood of success of the pregnancy is like 90 something percent. So typically, once you hear the heartbeat, you can kind of breathe a little bit of a sigh of relief because you're normally okay after that. In both of my pregnancies, my babies had heartbeats. Um, and in my first pregnancy, I was nine and a half weeks pregnant when we lost the baby. And in my second pregnancy, I was 11 weeks pregnant when we lost the baby. And so um, both of those babies were tested uh, for chromosomal abnormalities. And both of them came back chromosomally normal. And so it was this huge shock to my doctors. They're like, okay, you're healthy. The fetuses were healthy, the heartbeats, like what, what's going on? And so there was a lot of hypotheses about um, maybe some kind of potential um, blood clotting disorder. I tested negative for all of those. Um, I was tested for karyotypes. I, I went through everything. I went through the recurrent pregnancy loss panel, everything, and it was all normal. And so... I almost feel like because it was all normal, that made it worse for me because if you don't have a reason for the miscarriages, how do you know it's not going to happen again? And so um, last year, my husband and I started going through IVF because IVF would give us some control over the variables where they would um, take known good embryos and place them in a known good uterus, or so we thought at the time, um, once the lining was perfect and everything was good and they would have control over my estrogen, my progesterone, like any of the things that could impact a healthy pregnancy would all be very, very tightly controlled if we did IVF. And so we did IVF and um, 
I, I could do another video. Sorry, I'm grabbing my dog. Um, I can do another video on the IVF process, what that looked like. Our, our first egg retrieval was a total bust and we actually ended up with zero normal embryos. And our second retrieval was a huge success and we ended up with 12 normal embryos. Um, by normal, I mean euploid, PGTA tested. So no chromosomal abnormalities in those guys. So I can do another video if you guys want in the future where I talk through the protocols that I followed for my for my two different egg retrievals and what was done differently. Um, so for the after doing the second egg retrieval, we had a whole bunch of good embryos. And so we moved forward with transfer. And so far I've done two transfers of PGTA normal embryos, five day hatching, really like for those of you who haven't been through IVF, like these are really good numbers. My uterine lining looked perfect, like everything was good. And both of those transfers failed. And so rather than going through with a third transfer and not knowing what the results were gonna be, my doctor decided to put me through additional testing. And at this point I've had, oh gosh, going through this, whole process over the last four years of undiagnosed infertility. I've had so many ultrasounds and I've had the salio pingograms. I've had, um, I don't know, H HSGs. I've had, I've had hysteroscopy where they go up there with the camera. Everything looked normal. Everything looked fine. And then my doctor said that he wanted to order me an MRI of my uterus to check me for adenomyosis and endometriosis. And I honestly did not think that I had it because I thought like I watched YouTube videos of other women who talked about adenomyosis and endometriosis. And in most cases, they had it show up in ultrasound. And so I was like, look, if I had this, it would show up, you know, like it would definitely show up. And with the hysteroscopy, the saliano pingogram, I'm saying it wrong, but you, where they flush you with saline and take a picture. And it was all fine. And so I honestly did not think they were going to find it. And I got an MRI and the results came back and I totally have adenomyosis. And I had to do a lot of research on adenomyosis when the MRI results came back because I had a full like five days between when the results came back and when I had my follow-up appointment with my doctor. So I did a ton of research so I would be ready to ask him a lot of questions. And I was honestly kind of terrified because everything I was seeing on the internet told me that with endometriosis, they can go in, cut it out, clean it up. You're good to go. Like eventually your body will make more, but they can kind of give you a clean slate before they put the baby in um, for IVF patients. With adenomyosis, because the these cells are growing inside of the muscle of the uterus, the only way to remove adenomyosis is with a hysterectomy by taking the uterus out. And if you take the uterus out, what the hell are you going to put the baby in? And so I was like, crap, how are they even going to treat this? And so I started trying to do research on adenomyosis for IVF. And I was reading about the Lupron protocol. And um, I heard mixed things on that. I, I saw a lot of success stories with women who were on Lupron for a number of months prior to transfer. Um, and then I saw women who were like, don't ever take Lupron. It, it puts you into early menopause and all this crap. And I was like, oh my gosh. It's also interesting because as I started learning about adenomyosis and endometriosis, because again, they're very closely tied. I learned that maybe I did have symptoms after all. So disclaimer, I have a connective tissue disorder called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And Ehlers-Danlos syndrome does cause, um, among other symptoms, um, chronic pain. And it can cause me these like mystery pains sometimes where I'm fine and then like I have a really, really bad pain like right here for 10 minutes and then it goes away. Or I'll have really, really bad abdominal pain for a few minutes and then it goes away. And that's because our connective tissues, which hold everything together, are so stretchy that maybe sometimes things stretch a little bit too far and it causes a lot of pain because it just, you know, it's like it causes little tears and it's nothing that's gonna kill me, but it's like, ooh, ow, you know, in these random places. So for a long time, I've gotten really bad, really sharp, really like kind of quickly onset pain that will resolve after a couple minutes or maybe a couple hours and then I'm fine. So there has been a lot of time that 
there have been many times that I've randomly gotten pretty strong pelvic pain. Um, I did not think that that was endometriosis or adenomyosis. I did not think that was, I just thought it was my Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. When I researched adenomyosis and endometriosis, you know, leading up to my MRI and while I was waiting for the results, um, I was reading about women who had these periods that were so painful, they're balled up on the floor and they're vomiting and they're going to the emergency room for pain management because it was so awful. And mine were not that bad. Do I have painful periods? Yes. Would I say it's excruciating? No. But I also know that pain is subjective. And because I have this connective tissue disorder which causes chronic pain, maybe I have a higher pain tolerance. I've had a number of orthopedic surgeries, some of them really, really severe. I have chronic joint pain like literally every day. You know, I have, I do have pain. And so maybe I am experiencing high levels of pain due to my adenomyosis and endometriosis, but I'm not noticing it. I don't know. I don't, I honestly don't know. I have pelvic pain. I have painful periods, uh, but it's not like, I have to take off work whenever I, I have my period. You know what I mean? I hope this is making sense. Um, something else that that with hindsight was a symptom is a lot of times I just have this awareness of my uterus. And that doesn't mean that it's always painful, but there's always something off enough with it where I like, I don't feel my liver you know what I mean? Like I'm not just walking through life being able to feel my liver like I can my my fingers and my toes, but my liver's still in there doing its thing. But but there are a lot of times that I just have this awareness of my uterus. Like I can I can feel something's going on with it. And it's maybe not painful, maybe it's just a little uncomfortable, but I notice it. And I realize that most women aren't walking through life just aware of their uterus, you know, when it's when they're not on their period or leading up to it. So that was another symptom. Uh, another another symptom is, um, so it's strongly suspected that endometriosis and adenomyosis, um, one of the causes for these is estrogen dominance, is having a lot of estrogen or having a higher estrogen to progesterone ratio. And um, this can lead to very heavy periods, which I do not have. And that's one thing that led me to believe I didn't have it, was I have actually rather light periods most months. Um, so, uh, it can lead to really heavy periods. Estrogen dominance can also lead to cysts, ovarian cysts, um, uterine fibroids and uterine polyps. And I have had all three of these. I have had at one point or another surgery to remove fibroids, surgery to remove cysts and surgery to remove polyps. So even though I don't have the heavy periods, I've had a number of abnormal growths on my, you know, in and around my reproductive organs based on this estrogen dominance. And so I guess maybe that's also with hindsight a sign that there was an underlying condition because most women in their 30s aren't just like, and now it's a fibroid that's gone and now it's a polyp that's gone and here's some more cysts and that's gone. And so with hindsight, that was probably an indication that there was something going on, but you know, my doctors would just go in and cut it out and uh, now I'm better. And then something else pops up and they go in and cut it out and now I'm better. But really it was very likely caused this hormonal imbalance. Another interesting fact about adenomyosis and endometriosis is that doctors are, are still discovering more about this, but um, they think that there may be some kind of inflammatory or autoimmune component to it. So a lot of doctors encourage you to follow an anti-inflammatory diet once you've been diagnosed with endometriosis and adenomyosis. So I have adopted an anti-inflammatory diet. I can do another video on that if you guys want. I don't want to elaborate on it too much in here. It's like no gluten, um, no dairy, unless it's like organic grass-fed hormone-free stuff. Lots of fresh vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, greens. Um, if you have fruit, it needs to be like berries, only one or two servings a day because you want to avoid too much sugar. You don't can't have any processed foods, seed oils, stuff like that. So that was a, a huge uh, change for me because I did eat a lot of processed foods before. So I've adopted this anti-inflammatory diet. It does seem to be helping. This past weekend, I got really lazy and I had some, some pizza. Um, I was like, screw it. I'm having the gluten. I'm having all the oils. I'm having all the bad stuff. I just don't like cooking. And I 
a few hours later, I had this horrible headache that would not go away. And I'm like, crap, maybe they're onto something with this diet thing. And I was having stomach pain later that night. So, um, so here's kind of what my doctor is doing to treat my adenomyosis and endometriosis. Um, I am on the Lupron protocol right now. I will say it's not the most fun thing in the world. Um, I have been spotting and bleeding for about a week straight. Uh, I did experience my first hot flash last week and that was miserable. Um, but these menopausal systems will go away once I stop. Once I stop the Lupron, my normal cycle will resume. It's puppies and rainbows, we're good. Uh, but for right now, the Lupron's not great, but I'm hoping the symptoms will resolve as my body adjusts to existing in a state of very low estrogen because the Lupron lowers the estrogen in the woman who's um, taking it. So uh, after being on Lupron for three months, I'll stop the Lupron, start my period, and roll right into a transfer cycle, hopefully with kind of this suppressed endometrial overgrowth, we'll be able to transfer um, one of our many awesome little embryos we still have and see success. So that in a nutshell is the story of um, why my doctor suspected adenomyosis and endometriosis. And I'm so thankful for him because I have other healthcare practitioners I'm seeing right now. And when I told them that my um, RE, like my reproductive doctor was having me assessed for endometriosis, they were like, oh, you don't, you definitely don't have that. You definitely don't have that. You have no symptoms of that. And then it turns out that I do have it. So um, it's, I'm so thankful for him. And it turns out that this doctor that I'm seeing is also a very well-recognized expert on endometriosis. And he's done a ton of studies on it and written papers and done all that. And he teaches about it um, in college. And so um, I'm actually very, very lucky to have the doctor that I do because he, he knows his stuff when it comes to this. So that's the story of, you know, kind of what led to my diagnosis with hindsight, what some of my symptoms were when I was getting diagnosed with adenomyosis, endometriosis, and really high level what they're doing to treat it as far as the Lupron and the anti-inflammatory diet. So if you want me to talk more about any of those things, I'm actually thinking I'm going to do a like what I eat in a week video where I show you guys what my diet looks like now that I'm doing this anti-inflammatory thing. Um, let me know in the comments if you want me to elaborate on any of that. I, I do think that transparency is important. We don't talk enough about infertility and I'm using air quotes because I'm, I'm certain I'm going to be able to get pregnant. So like, I don't really consider myself infertile, although my doctors do. <laughs> um, I think that it's really important to be transparent about infertility, about miscarriage, about health, because, um, it can be really isolating when you don't have people that you can relate to about this. So if you want me to talk more about any of these things, please let me know. You know, I'm happy to do that. Thanks so much for joining me and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye friends.